Yeah, good morning. Uh, nice to see you. And today we're going to talk about psychology uh, and data and how we can actually approach psychology uh, and cultural issues with data. So again, my name is Alexandra. Uh, I'm working in a company which is called Bunch, and we're a bunch of uh, social scientists and engineers who are actually trying to help teams uh, to do the better job and to succeed. So I came from the political science background, and then I switched to data science because um, when I was studying um, social science, I realized that there's so many gaps in theory, in the way data is tackled, in the way uh, data is um, analyzed, and I really, really want to get out of this space because there's, there were so many question marks, um, and I didn't want to uh, like go there. My principles didn't allow me, uh, but <laughs> now I'm in a company that is dealing with psychology, and I'm actually really proud of this because with the methods, uh, with the technology that we have now, I really think that all the like social community problems uh, can be handled uh, and with with the data uh, approach. So yeah, our mission is to increase the, the performance of teams uh, through better collaboration. And by better collaboration, we mean uh, better culture. And this, this is not clear causality, but I will try you to explain you in a really short way why we're talking about culture and performance. So uh, yeah, and the idea is that why, for example, 90% of startups fail. Uh, in the beginning, you have a really nice team, like your three of you, you're like finally got some money and you're having fun, you have a clear goal, all good. But then you're hiring more people and more people means more opinions. More opinions mean some people are like deprioritized and you're starting to scratch each other in different directions. And also, environment outside doesn't help investors, uh, crazy clients, uh, like environment wants to kill you. That's why you need to protect each other and to make sure that you're healthy inside. Uh, okay, uh, now we know that culture is important, but the question is, uh, then, then now what? Uh, because everyone knows that culture exists, but no one knows what exactly it is. Like, what is this? Is this like the thing that when I'm talking to my colleague, uh, while I'm having like a coffee, or like, is it when uh, my CEO is, uh, is like sending me a nice salary slips and attaching a giphy? Uh, what is this? But basically it's all of these things but uh, in organizational psychology, there is like a century of research of actually defining culture from different perspectives. And for example, in, um, in Harvard, they're putting lots of effort in understanding how leadership has effect on uh, culture and the performance. In other cases, it's diversity. And um, we decided to go with the approach of Stanford, and to define culture as uh, six dimensions, six norms, uh, which is basically nor norms is the things in that, that you believe in. So it's not your skills, it's not your personality, it's basically the things that you prioritize at work. Um, and it can be translated in these six dimensions from adaptability to detail orientation. And we do understand that its model has its own constraints, but it, it was validated with the research and it's easy to understand and people can see themselves in, in, in this model. Uh, but good, we defined uh, the culture and then uh, how we can actually measure culture and people usually, how people usually do this in psychology. They go, do surveys, uh, but we realized that no, uh, it's, it is an approach, but if you wanna actually tackle this and track your culture 
every day or every week, you can't do assessments every day. So we realized, okay, uh, then we are gonna collect all the data from collaboration tools and actually try to understand uh, and extract uh, cultural behaviors from, from this data. And we started with a Slack. I think, uh, I hope most of you know what a Slack, it's like a collaboration tool where like teams are uh, talking to each other, there are public channels where you can discuss things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, we started to extract uh, and like integrate with Slack and to uh, get data from, uh, from customers and people out there in order to understand what we know about culture from this data. But then the question was like, okay, we have lots of these texts, then what? Because uh, we realized we have a message and we need to translate this message to a certain uh, cultural dimension, like for example, adaptability or detail orientation. And the way you do this in machine learning, like you, like you need to classify, uh, you need to data with the uh, labels. Uh, we didn't have resources, uh, like to have some students uh, to do this. So that's why I started uh, to take a look how people do this in political science, for example, or like political uh, psychology. And uh, I found out that there is like actually uh, a method to do this and actually define dictionaries. For example, there is Harvard Dictionary of Psychology with the defined categories psychological categories and terms that refers to these categories. And I was like, okay, that's a good beginning. Uh, so I took the categories that refers to our model and that was the first iteration. There were much more iterations. Uh, and at first iteration I realized, okay, some dimensions uh, are hidden more with dictionary, some are hidden less. Uh, and maybe it's because of the context, because it's, it's not just uh, we're talking about adaptability or we're talking about collaboration. Uh, the data that we have from Slack is data of uh, the employees that are working. Uh, but yeah, the way it works is basically like this. For example, Angela is writing the client is expecting it tonight. The client refers to customer ex uh, orientation, expecting it tonight refers to result orientation. So yeah, I started uh, to work with topic instruction and realized, okay, what's going on in certain clusters that refers to certain dimensions. And I found out that there is a, an association between clusters and specific roles. And for example, tech teams, design teams, uh, they, they were very high on detail orientation. And I was like, okay, uh, this, this, teams are uh, pretty detailed, so let me uh, make my dictionary richer with their lexicon. And that's why I added uh, things like tests, reviews, GitHub, uh, and distributions uh, started uh, to look like uh, more similar. The same, for example, for uh, growth teams. Uh, I found a lot uh, association between customer rotation and of course growth team because they're talking about customers' accounts and they're showing their um, caring about customers with the things like thank you, I do appreciate this, and so on. Uh, so for now, uh, this is by the way data from like three weeks ago. So for now we have more than a million of messages, um, which is good. Uh, lots of users, so there's lots of data to analyze, experiment, uh, and have inputs. And we have lots of uh, hiccups, uh, lots of learnings, but I think the first question that we had from people outside, okay, you have this uh, nice dictionary, nice scoring engine, but how you actually validate this? And then I remember I read some article uh, about Google Translator, that it took Google Translator 15 years to actually reach the point when it's like uh, Google Translator translates things the same human being does. And I was like, okay, 
uh, why we can't compare the way our uh, scoring engine works with the uh, experts' uh, ratings. And we did this, uh, and we found out the first uh, correlation coefficients were like 0 0.2. Uh, for now, it's uh, 0 0.3, um, but we're working on making it uh, higher and higher. Uh, so yeah, things that worked, uh, Creating corpus worked, uh, unigrams, cross checks, and very important things. So we are putting all of our uh, data from messages to Elasticsearch, and then uh, it was really, really good to actually track what's going on with your data on a daily basis, especially when like new data is coming, uh, and what's going on with your dimensions, and uh, immediately uh, go and check why there was uh, changes in distributions. What didn't work, engrams, fuzzy match, and we still don't understand humor. And I think when we will understand humor, uh, humor robots will uh, rule the world. Yes. Uh, but yeah, the way it looks now in product, you basically have a dashboard where you have uh, dynamics of your culture over time. Uh, the main uh, changes and the cultural strength score, which is based on basically variants uh, of uh, communication of the team members. So basically now you can uh, choose people that you want to see uh, on this dashboard from, from which people you want to see uh, data. We are not allowing people to track only one person because it's creepy. Uh, yes. And we think it's unethical. And so you can choose minimum three people and see their results over time. So it helps to teams to do retrospectives. It helps them to react to urgent things like, for example, you have a release and you're late and you realize that your result orientation is like 5%. Uh, yeah, you need to do something with this. Otherwise, you're not going to release anything. And besides this, we're, we're showing people where they stand uh, comparing to other companies in our database, which helps them to identify are they good, are they bad, where they need to go, um, and et cetera. Another thing, uh, so we are doing assessment in the beginning uh, to show people what they prioritize. And then we're comparing their prioritization to their uh, Slack behaviors. And it's, it's interesting to see the gap, for example. And the gap means that your beliefs are going against uh, your behaviors. It means your environment forces you to do something different. And that might be very painful, actually, for people. And the idea is that this, this gap needs to go uh, down. And it, it works. I don't know whether you know about this biofeedback effect. For example, when per, uh, when person is nervous, and if you're showing the heart rate or the pressure, and from the fact that person is actually looking at this, he's becoming less nervous. So we believe it. We didn't test this, but we believe it also can help. Uh, the same way to reduce this gap when people are actually seeing and realizing, aha, I prioritize um, detail orientation, but I'm not behaving this way. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe I need to change something. Uh, yeah, what's next? We do realize that uh, this O'Reilly model, uh, model with six dimensions, is actually has its own constraints. And there are lots of things there uh, that uh, we need to consider. Uh, that's why uh, we now do experiments with network analysis to extract psych psychological metrics as safety, transparency, co connectivity, leadership impact, uh, with a sentiment analysis, mood in a team, which is also very important, and to actually realize what's going on uh, in your team, in your network, and help teams to, to be more connected, to be more safe, and perform better. Um, another thing uh, is actually connect your culture to your actual outputs. 
so that's why now we're experimenting with Jira data, HubSpot, uh, uh, GitHub data. Um, and basically, the idea is that if you see that your performance, like number of bugs, uh, you can call it uh, whatever you want, like number of bugs is going up, uh, maybe there is something wrong with your behavior. Maybe something changed in your uh, culture. And I found out the association between number of bugs and customer orientation and adaptability. Uh, or like, for example, uh, also tested um, the data from the Google Calendar. Um, and yeah, it's, I, just, I just presented this for the team. Um, and basically the idea is that if you, if you see that something is changing in your everyday behavior, it has consequences on your culture and the output further. So for example, if you're switching uh, between the tasks all the time, uh, there are different consequences. You're becoming more adaptable, you're hustling, but you're delivering less polished results and it might be a problem. But it's up to you to choose what do you need right now. Um, also, when we were like testing our uh, dictionary, the idea was that the scoring engine should work uh, the same uh, on different data sets. And because we're still trying to understand what actually makes uh, companies more successful, we decided to create um, profiles of the companies out there, and we decided to create a profiles of four startup ecosystem from Berlin to London. Uh, so we, what we did was scraped data from the Glassdoor. Uh, why from the Glassdoor? Because uh, well, like we could scrape data from their websites, but data from their websites is basically um, more like uh, what's, what's marketing is doing, is like shaping of your brand, uh, then like Glassdoor is basically the feedback to, of your employees. So we run the, uh, our scoring engine and translated Glassdoor uh, reviews to these six dimensions, uh, and we collected data for startups and unicorns, and it basically looked like, looked like this. Uh, you have six dimensions, and then you have variation uh, and like, yeah, this is Tesla, and Tesla is super customer-oriented and result-oriented. And yeah, what we found out that there is a difference between their culture, and for example, San Francisco is super adaptive and collaborative, New York is customer-oriented, uh, London is collaborative, and Berlin didn't show any outstanding uh, behaviors. Um, there might be lots of reasons why. Um, it just needs more research, but it was interesting to see. And then compare, we also compare the subsets of average companies, unicorns and super unicorns. And we've, what we found out that if you wanna be a unicorn, you need to be adaptable. You need to see what's going on out there. You need to feed uh, to the market. You need to change your strategy very fast. Otherwise, you're not gonna survive. Uh, but if you already a unicorn, and if you want to be a super unicorn, uh, you need to be result oriented. You need to deliver things as fast as you can. You need to show your results and convince uh, people, customers, investors out there that you can succeed. That's it. <laughs> Are there any questions? Sorry. Could you please repeat the question into the microphone? Will do, will do. Um, you said it is unethical uh, to track single persons in a company, and you also said that you target uh, small to medium-sized companies, but don't you think in that this uh, doesn't scale in big companies where exchanging a single team is a pretty simple thing and uh, not really uh, has uh, such a great impact as in a small company? that it's easier to uh, exchange the whole team instead of looking what's the real cause of the problem uh, instead of um, tackling the problem, the underlying one. 
Mm, I mean, like first, sorry. I mean, it, 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 like the idea is that teams are not like, it, it, it's, it's not, teams as a team, as a department, and the consequences, the bad consequences that you have in culture happens on the team level and not on the global level. And that's why we're thinking it's better to look at the really people's culture and like team's culture of like five to 10 people than looking at the whole organization. Does it make sense? Thank you. Ah, excuse me, one, one question. So um, if you, if let's say the team lead uh -huh. um, sees results that his team is not collaborating very well, um, there might be a danger that the team lead is telling to the, to the employees, okay, please write these words or these phrases within your chat to maybe tune the results of the team and without actually getting better. Um, have you thought about this problem and how would you tackle this? I mean, first of all, people don't know which words they need to use. Uh, yeah, they just don't know dictionary. Dictionary is, uh, is our secret. Uh, they can only guess. Uh, but what was interesting is to, what we found as a feedback, that actually teams started to collaborate more in public channels than private channels because they realized, okay, uh, there is something that tries to understand what's going on, and if I'm not actually uh, transparent in what's going on, uh, there might be a problem. Uh, and people, yeah, people just started to discuss things in public channels more, um, which, which um, made their communication better. Hey, thank you. Here, uh, I have two questions. One, um, would it possible that about a dictionary, like um, what you classify there, like the classify there is about which team use which word and not by culture? Because I can imagine dev team and uh, I don't know a marketing team uses uh, use um, different words for collaboration. And the, the jargon itself, it's different. This is the first question. Um, the second one, how the users um, are using um, the product because I can imagine, you, you, we saw the graph with the um, meeting time go higher and maybe productivity go lower. And I can imagine in some, for one team that's mean, um, I, I, like for, for one team they be starting to use uh, in Slack more and other one making the meeting more efficient. So for me it's feel like you really like the user need to spend a lot of time to analyze what you see too, because you just see correlation. You don't see causality there. Yeah, first of all, the things with the meetings are not there. It's just on experiment and testing stage and trying to realize whether there is where we can get any, any association. Yes, not causality between uh, culture and performance for now. Um, like, I didn't uh, understand the idea that uh, people in the marketing team use different uh, lexical, like terms for collaboration, for example, as people in the dev team, because, for example, collaboration refers to things like we, team, to plural things, and I, I suppose people are using these things in uh, different departments. Uh, that's why we're not trying now to go so intense on the specific specialization terms. Um, yes. What was the second question? Ah, how, how, yeah, how users, yes, yes. Right. Um, 
Hiya. I just wanted to go back to um, the question that this gentleman was asking. Um, you were saying that um, what happened when um, people saw that uh, there was less collaboration happening, that they would use the public channels of, com of communicating more, so the Slack and, and so on. Um, but what does that mean for like face-to-face -face communication within, a, within an office? And um, I'm not sure if you've got a psychology background, but what does it mean for um, these other ways of interacting with your um, office um, colleagues and peers? If you're kind of making people focus on this thing that is tracked um, and this thing that, is, that happens through a computer instead of a face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's actually a good question. Uh, like, for example, in MIT, they, they had a research on actually tracking people in real life. So they put badges on people and analyzed how far they stand from each other. Uh, and it's open source, and the problem is that no one is using this. So they created these amazing things, they found amazing results, but no one using this. And we do know that there is a pretty significant part of communication that is happening uh, offline. Um, and unfortunately, we can't, uh, we can't get this information. Uh, people don't want to do this. Um, but it doesn't mean that you don't need to try to get at least some information about your culture from uh, online communication. Uh, what's happening uh, in the offline when they see what's when they see that their results changed in the online communication? We don't know. We don't know. Hi, uh, interesting talk, but uh, is this everything allowed uh, from a data privacy part, point of view? Because in Germany I know there's, uh, you can't do everything like uh, watching what your uh, colleagues do. And that's uh, basically what you do. Is this allowed in Germany? Have you checked it? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, like. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert uh, from this area, but from what I know, first of all, your, your data as an employee uh, belongs to your boss. And if boss gives permission to use your data, we can use it. But we do uh, understand that that's not okay. So that's why, uh, first of all, we're analyzing only public channels. Second of all, um, when we're doing integration with Slack, and when the person, uh, so as a team lead, you can invite people to this dashboard. And as a team member, you can give your permission to whether you want to give your data or not. Okay. Um, well, maybe just a quick question. Um, in the previous slide, you mentioned that adaptability and um, above average result orientation are important factors for unicorn startups, I think. Um, don't you think that customer orientation also an important factor? I mean, um, just want to know um, how do you determine that, maybe more technical details. Um, yeah, of course I do. I do believe that customer orientation is very important because, for example, we found that for New York, uh, customer orientation was um, outstanding compared to other cities. Um, but we do didn't find the significant results for customer orientation uh, in the whole data set. Probably uh, we just need more data, more control variables, uh, that's it. 
my research. Hi. Um, so I would be interested, is there some discussion, because in Europe now we have GDPR, yeah. Um, is there some discussion going on? Because like when you have a company and the company like wants that everyone opts in to this kind of, that your data is measured, that all your stuff is measured, but I cannot be forced to opt in, right? Then uh, what happens there? Is there some discussion going on? Do you know something? So. Um, like you, you can be forced, so if you... But then only if there are alternatives. So what happens then? Can I, will the company then fire, fire an employee who says, uh, I don't give you permission to, to track this data of mine or uh, I don't give you permission to analyze that? Is this? I mean, if, the, if your company want to do this with you, this company is going to have a huge lawsuit <laughs> because it's, it's just simply illegal. Now you need, you, you need to ask, you need to have this page in your product where you ask a person, do you want to share your data with us? Exactly. No, I don't. That's it. But it's, it's, it's actually an interesting psychological thing that people are willing to share data more uh, easily when you actually ask them about this. When you actually ask them, they're like, okay, they care about me. Share data. Or, they, they, or they're like checking things, testing things, and then they're sharing data after. Okay, but there's nothing like the situation that then, especially when you see then that this goes into your assessment that then people like feel like, I don't know, maybe this is a German attitude, but I, I, I don't like this thing of that I have the feeling I'm observed, you know, like, like that there is like, because it could be biased, right, from the beginning on, and I, I could be like, like a certain kind of extravagant person, and I like to write stuff in a certain way, or maybe there's like humor or something like that, what you told, so, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was just this question. No, that's 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 a very important question because people do have this feedback. People don't like uh, to be evaluated. No one likes, and the idea is that that it's respon it's our responsibility to make sure that data of the of the users of people are not used in the wrong way. It's our responsibility to make sure that the team leaders and bosses are not forcing people. Uh, to do anything that they don't want. And the idea is that no one is judging you. It should help you to understand just better who you are. That's it. And if you don't like the result, fine. Don't take it personally because there is nothing about your personality. Okay, cool. Thanks.